the question today is where are we anybody knows brockton and we feel we are not there we have an illusion we have an unreality around us that we are not there we have created a separation and during the course of the workshop we'll go through the different stages how we created this illusion that we are not at home that we are somewhere else and how that separation this illusion that we are separate we are away we are not we are not where we actually are has led to all the misery unhappiness and problems of life that we face here that if we discovered who we really were and where we were actually right now there would be none of this misery and unhappiness in this world that's the whole purpose of this workshop there is a question mark about our true nature what is our true nature what is the self that takes a decision to come up to a workshop like the one today and to ask a question or to expect an answer or to give an answer what is the true nature of a human being who wants to explore seek and find answers is the true nature of a human being a piece of flesh a body a physical body with a brain which somehow by forces still not fully explained has become alive and through the genetic code that the body has inherited from its parents it is functioning semi automatically to go on through various stages of experiences and once this experience with the body ends that life goes out that's the end of the show is this is this the truth this could be one truth the material scientists like to believe that that is the truth it helps them to believe that that is the truth that we are just a material body that the brain is merely a, a machine like other parts of the body it's an organ that functions through the uh, neuro systems through the spinal cord and all the extension of the nervous system throughout the body that this biological feature of our body is responsible for consciousness is responsible for our ability to see with our eyes to hear with our ears and to use all the other sense perceptions and sense organs through different spots in the physical brain where with the nerve endings there the brain can store retrieve information like a big computer and as the brain functions the mind starts functioning also and therefore this whole thing is a very sophisticated biological machine which came which became alive we don't know when there's still a question mark did it become alive at conception in the mother's womb or did it become alive at quickening in the fifth month of pregnancy or did it become alive at the time of birth when the umbilical cord was cut and the baby was separated from the mother which is the starting point for an individual life to begin and become conscious grow through all the experiences of childhood youth middle age old age and death and then this that's the end of the show this could be a possibility except it leaves lot of questions unanswered one question it leaves unanswered is that if this is the total package we have which constitutes the human being how can this package reach out into areas of consciousness which are not part of the environment of this package how can a human being who is constructed in this way and is limited by a life from birth to death can reach out and think of and postulate ideas and concepts which are totally beyond the physical environment around that person how can such a being have an imagination so strong that it can bring up ideas that lead to progress of the very package that one is using how can technology of this kind come up through a package of this kind a package that starts with birth and ends with death 
and the total experience packed into that brain, into that computer, is only generated from childhood, does not permit that consciousness to perform those miraculous things that it is doing. It's a question that has not been answered fully. And that is a gray area, even in medical sciences and empirical science, it's a gray area as to where do we stand in relation to these functions of consciousness that are way beyond any known way of storage of information on a biological computer or the brain and then using it, retrieving it to create that kind of consciousness. Secondly, how can this consciousness then have experiences of flights into higher regions like the yogis do? If we are bound by physical experience alone, how can we also be flying in the sky and seeing worlds which don't exist here and describe them so accurately? How can people sitting in different parts of this globe, born separately with different parents, different environments, come up with the same kind of experience and same kind of narration? It doesn't fit in. Well, we have tried to fit in because, as I said, the material scientist would like to fit every type of uh, experience into this given premise that this is just a material world and all the rest is just loaded upon it. The explanation they give is that after all, the world is an ongoing, ongoing system. It is not created at the same time as the birth of a baby. The world is already there. The baby is born and picks up so much of the world, first of all from the genetic codes in the cells inherited from the parents, which means when a baby is born and the cells in the brain of that baby are the cells of the parents and grandparents and great-grandparents and of the entire human race. Therefore, any experience that happened at any time, maybe millions of years ago, is also brought in at this time through the genetic code of a newborn. And therefore, there is an explanation that this life, although the brain becomes alive only at birth now, it picks up a system of information, a series of uh, inf uh, informations from the genetic code inherited from the past. This has especially come up recently after the discovery of so much programming on the DNA molecules, that the programming is immense, that you can even predict by looking at the DNA molecule that a person who is born now at the age of 40 will start smoking, which was thought to be an addiction. Smoking was considered an addiction, was considered to be something that is uh, acquired by bad habits and bad company and association and buying cheap cigarettes or whatever it was. You never expected that your great-grandfather's gene will let you know at birth that at age 40 or 42, you'll start smoking that you won't smoke earlier, or that you will become an alcoholic, or that you will become a rapist. All these are now being ascribed to genetic code. Things that were considered to be arising from free will are now being described as the chemistry of the body, that the chemicals which are generated according to the genetic code create all our life. It's very interesting. It's creating a little problem for these uh, material scientists because it can mean that the genetic code completely, totally predetermines your life. If the genetic code predetermines your life totally and you have no will of your own, you are living in an illusion of a will. And this they are willing to concede, that so many things we do thinking that we are deciding those things are really happening because of the propensity created in us by our own genetic code. So the result is that life's events are programmed in little little cells and little molecules of DNA which occur in every cell of the body, in every part of the body, even the brain, and therefore our life is predetermined by these little cells. There is another explanation which was given by the Russian scientists in the, in the 60s. The Russians believed that everything was material and when one of the professors from Jaipur University in India, who was investigating cases of reincarnation, when that professor recorded and listed a number of actual cases where 
people had remembered past lives and accurately described scenes which were taking place somewhere else, such as a child was born in India and described its past life in Japan and gave details of the streets where the little child used to live earlier and that professor along with his team went to Japan with the child and saw exactly the same streets that the little poor child who could never have even read a book about Japan was describing. He recorded all these things. He recorded 3,000 such cases. He was a professor of psychology and he went to Russia where they invited him to see whether these cases happen only in the Orient, only in India and China and Japan or do they happen in a materialist communist society such as in Moscow and Leningrad and he went and investigated there and lo and behold very soon he found several Russians who remembered their past lives and he recorded those lives too and he took those Russian especially young children who remembered their past life he took them to the locations <coughs> which they described which were sometimes very far away and verified that what these little kids were saying was in fact true even the doctrine of carrying all the information on the genetic code could not explain how a child carrying his genetic code from his parents could simultaneously see what was happening in another country to which his parents never belonged and he was not picking up a genetic code from what happened in the past million years or thousand years or five hundred years or fifty years. The child was describing something that happened only a few years ago in another country. The genetic code explanation did not fit it. The Russians wouldn't buy it. They said this is not possible. But they would not buy that there is a soul and there is a, a, a conscious power that comes into the body to make it alive. They said no, the body is alive automatically. The other premise holds good. But we must find an explanation how these kids can talk of things that are somewhere else and can be verified. There are too many recorded cases for them to say it's just a fluke, it's just a chance occurrence or a coincidence of one person talking of his street in another city which was like a street in some other city and therefore he mixed up. He could not say that because there were too many cases. The Russian scientists, members of the academy, they are supposed to be the highest body. The Academy of Scientific Investigations in Soviet Union, the former Soviet Union, they held these studies and published some works which I had access to and I studied them in the late 60s. And I was surprised to find how they wanted to explain this phenomenon. They had to explain it materially. They had to explain that it was only a material body which comes to life when it is born and dies and ends there. And within that, they had to explain how reincarnation is taking place and people are talking of other lives. Their explanation was very interesting. And that was that after all, when a person dies, what happens to the body? The body is cremated or buried and all the cells of the body, the organic matter, is dissipated into the elements. It goes into the air, it goes into it goes into the earth, it goes into different forms of solids, gases that are existing on this planet and in course of time the westerly winds, they blow these different molecules floating around and they blow all over the earth. And it may happen that when a new baby is being formed and the mother is eating some cookies or something and one of those molecules comes in that cookie and is eaten by the mother and happens to go and form the nutrient part of the brain of the unborn child. And that particular molecule which carried the memory in the brain of the dead person is now carrying the same memory and comes into the body of the newborn and gets stuck in the, in the brain of that newborn. And when the newborn is born and talks, it's from that memory molecule that came through the air. This is not, this is not uh, kid stuff. This was the finding of a scientific body of experts. And they said this is what happens and it's wrong to assume that there are souls. It's wrong to assume that there are souls that have been living prior to this body and then they come and inhabit the body and then they go out and then they live again somewhere else. It's only these molecules which form the, 
the brain. And when it was pointed out to them that this would be extremely rare for one particular molecule of one dead person to float around in the air and go and get stuck in the brain of another person, they said, exactly, that is why the cases of people who tell their past lives are so rare. It's rare. that You don't hear everybody remembering past lives. It is so rare. It is so rare that people tell of their past lives because it is very unlikely for a particular memory cell to go and get lodged in the brain cell of another unborn baby. That was an explanation they gave in all seriousness. As it happened, there were mathematicians there too. The mathematicians knew a law called the law of probability. They had worked out what are the probable chances of things happening. And they found that the probability of a floating cell like this coming and getting lodged in the unborn was far less than even the limited number of reported cases of children remembering past lives. The law of probability worked against the Russian uh, conclusion that this body is carrying these memories because of the floating molecules. They are having second thoughts on it. They are having second thoughts or are still investigating in secrecy. I don't know if there are still any more secrets in Russia, but they are still investigating the cases that they found in Russia of past lives. And that professor, Professor Banerjee, brought all the cases with him to India and in Jaipur in the pink city and is still carrying on investigation and finding out that those Russians were not born in Russia previously. They had memories of several other lands. Well, there are some other uh, strange evidences which people want to dismiss as unlikely. Right here, not too far from here, in the East Coast, you had Edgar Casey and his readings. If anybody recalls, I don't know if any one of you actually have uh, gone through the readings that he made. The Edgar Casey readings were uh, were made against his will. He didn't want to make those readings. He, this, the 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 gift of being able to see things at a distance, not remember past lives, but to see things at a distance came to him unknowingly, unwittingly, without learning, without preparation. Even as a schoolboy, when he used to go to school, he would get a strange feeling. And he would say, loosen my tie. The school tie that he was wearing, he would loosen the tie on the way to school with other kids. He would sit and he would go into an unconscious state. So far as he was aware, he was in an unconscious state. And he would start mumbling that grandma is now making waffles or whatever she was doing. Or your mother is now cooking something else. He would tell the other people. And it became so interesting, they would run to find out, Grandma, were you doing this? How did this fellow know? How did Edgar find out what somebody else was doing? It started from there. And it was a big game for the kids. And every day it happened. It went on and on. And he began to, as you know, give readings about medicines, old herbal medicines, which were unknown. People were started taking treatments for their illnesses based upon what Edgar Casey would recommend is the right appropriate medicine. None of those medicines were any modern medicines with brand names at all. I think I think he believed in what are those medicines which are not branded called? They recommend generic. generic. He gave all generic prescriptions. And he would say, you go and find some kind of balm and some of these things and some salve from here, from plant. If you couldn't find it, if you say, you had to put the next question to him when he was again in a state of unconsciousness. When he was unconscious, you could say, I couldn't find that bomb you were recommending. Where is it? He'd say, go to that person's house in third shelf and there it's lying. And people went and discovered it. And this was not a remembering of past life. What, what, kind of, uh, what kind of molecules, floating molecules came into that head to create this experience? The most surprising part of Edgar Casey's readings came when he told a priest that you are suffering something because of what happened in the past life. Edgar Casey did not believe in past lives. He did not believe in reincarnation. 
He did not believe in reincarnation even after making that unconscious statement about past life. That was the biggest, biggest uh, surprise for him. He denied that he said this, but they used to record by that time. Every statement he made was recorded. And as he went on, he not only talked of past lives, he talked of several past lives. As if every person that came in this in the state on the east coast of the United States must have been at some time in in a remote past, maybe hundred years ago. If it was another life, it was not three hundred years ago. After hundred years, he would skip to a life three thousand years ago. I don't know if you have seen his readings. After three thousand years, he would skip to Atlantis ten thousand years ago. He would relate a person to two, three past lives with big gaps of several thousand years. And he would talk of things happening at that time which had no relevance to what is happening here today. What kind of floating molecules can do this? Edgar Cayce was well publicized, well documented, well investigated. He was investigated by medical scientists in this country. He was investigated by attorneys. And you know when doctors and attorneys combine, they leave no stone unturned. Okay, they leave no bone unturned. <laughs> and later on, we'll have some jokes uh, from Huey on that. <laughs> the point I'm making is that this material scientist, the proposition they give, <coughs> we may like to accept it. They want to accept it. They want us to accept it. They leave so many questions unanswered, it becomes difficult to accept it. So one moves on. One says, okay, so far so good, but this doesn't give me all the answers. I want to know more. Is the life force, this consciousness that lives in this body, that makes the body alive, does it have a, a longer, a longer life than the life of the body or is it just confined to the life of this birth and death of this body? So when we go to the next step, we find that religion, which has affected the lives of most of us, because very, I find very few atheists. Mostly people believe in God. And some atheists also say, thank God I am an atheist. <laughs> so you see that the concept of God coming as, as a creator, super creator, who is looking over us, that, that stretches out our life. And religion almost universally has suggested that life is not a short period of stay here in one body that there is this life force or soul or spirit is continuous, is immortal, is of the same stuff as the creator. All religions all over the world, growing even, growing even in isolated areas, came up with similar propositions that the life force that makes us conscious was a continuous stream. It did not come just for a little while. So therefore, people began to look again at this question of why people are created differently. Why is there so much discrimination? We want to practice non-discrimination and yet we are formed, according to religion, in the likeness of our creator. A human being has been likened to the creator and it has been said not only by one religious sect but by religion generally that the human being is the top of creation and the reason for placing this human life at top of creation above all other forms of life is that it is in the likeness of the creator. If it is in the likeness of the creator, why are we trying to say there should be no discrimination, there should be equality, when the creator didn't follow any of these rules at all? He made the most unequal people you can find. He gave birth and put souls in poor people and let them be poor, exploited. He put the same souls of his own self into rich people, made them rich. He made some so sick and suffering, some so healthy. And what kind of creator was that? We are certainly not a likeness of that creator. If the creator created only a one-time life. A one-time life makes that creator so discriminatory, so unlike us, that there is no way we can say that we are in the likeness of the creator. Yet, if we do not consider this one life as the total creation or the total housing for that soul or that soul part of the creator, 
then he can be a non-discriminating creator. Maybe we were rich and became poor by our own actions, by our own choices, choices that we made in the same way like the creator made choices. And then we became rich again, then we became healthy and sick. If this is an ongoing cycle of reincarnations, of rebirths again and again, then we can say, yes, the fact that we are against discrimination is also consistent with the Creator who gave us enough chance, enough lifetimes for us to go, uh, run above discrimination. That again, this is from religion. Religion itself suggests that there has to be life prior to this life and there has to be life after this life if enough chance has to be given for the living soul to go through the experiences with equality with other souls. If you take a spiritual view, or take a mystical view, or take a view of the yogis, meditational view, forget the religious view, the meditational view, the yogis go into meditation, into trance, and in that, in that meditation of various kinds, there are many kinds of meditation, they go into meditation of various kinds, and they directly access their past lives or go into some hypnotic uh, trances in which by suggestion the hypnotist can put you, regress you into a past life memory. These are recorded cases too. There may not be too many, but there are enough to give us food for thought that you can regress and remember something that happened way back. At one time, it was considered that if a particular date of history comes to you again and again, some people say, we can't figure out what happened on 16th of June, 1653. But why did you pick up this date, 16th of June, 1653? Don't know. But I can't get rid of this date. It comes to me again and again. So you go to a past life regressor, and he says, look back. If he's a good regressor, he'll start from now to prevent the error of total fantasy coming up. If a person says, well, look at that date, and there you are, and makes a suggestion, it can be fantasy. But a good regressor doesn't do that. A good regressor will say, look where you are now. Now remember what happened yesterday. Do you remember it? Yes. What happened day before yesterday? Takes gradually, through memory, through the channels of memory, takes you back slowly and slowly and says, do you remember something of your childhood? Do you remember something earlier than that? So that the trend of the uh, recall process, the process that recalls memories, the trend is towards deeper and deeper, older and older memories. Once you put this into motion, that a person is remembering older and older things and says, yes, I remember before that this happened. Yes, now I recall when I was very small one day, I was left alone by my parents and I cried and howled all day. Now I remember this and you start, start screaming, reliving those, those childhood traumas. And this kind of regression is going on. So yes, now I remember I was riding a coach and there was a big man with me. And I was very big too. This happens in the same trend when you are examining childhood. Now, there's not one or two cases. There are thousands of cases of such records being kept of regression, of memory. They are not saying there is a past life. They are only saying if this memory, human memory in the brain, which is being recalled by association, by suggestion, if this recall can lead you to remember that you were very small and remember further before that you were very big, gives rise to feelings that there is something in this memory that has not been created totally out of fantasy, but may have some relationship to a past life. Then if you take like this and bring back, do you remember further back, a century back, two centuries back? You can say, yes, I recall now on the 16th of June, 1653, I recall. I was there sitting near the ocean and this happened. I met that man and he did something very, very traumatic. That's why the memory got embedded. Almost like something that happened in childhood. Such a person will relive it and after reliving, after that session, will walk for 
days and months and years telling that that recall is not memory. I actually relived. You, you meet these people all the time. These are not investigations conducted in a shroud of mystery and uh, in, a, in a state of yoga in caves and so on in the mountain tops. This is done in labs where everything is being recorded and monitored. The point I'm making is that with all this evidence around us, it is reasonable to assume that it is, that there is some life that is going on continuously and has never ended. And therefore, there is some validity to the statement that religion makes that the life force which makes this body and brain alive, the soul of a human being, the spirit that makes it alive, is a continuing force and does not begin with this body and does not end with the death of this body. And therefore, it's a subject worth investigating. Which brings me to the real part of our workshop today, that if this subject is worth investigating, and we are questioning all these things and putting these questions in our own heads and then before other people, based upon a conscious self that is asking these questions, it's reasonable to ask, what is the real substance that constitutes that consciousness? What is the real self that is inside the body and obviously is not the body? We can come to this conclusion by any kind of investigation. In the course of my life, st studying physics, chemistry, graduating in these subjects, empirical scientist, skeptic, grown like a skeptic, trained to be a skeptic, don't believe unless you can experiment and find a universal truth. That's my attitude. I started like that. I couldn't help coming to these conclusions that there is something more worth investigating. And when it comes to this, that the real substance that ought to be investigated is our own conscious self. What is the nature of that conscious self that is existing longer than this body? Obviously, the answer has to be found to this question by going as close to that conscious self as possible. What, where is that conscious self? You can't say there's a soul floating. Some people like to think there may be a little light, a little candle that maybe is lighted up inside. Well, surgeons have been cutting the brains. They cut every part of the body. They never found any light inside. They never found any candles burning inside. Obviously, it's not a physical candle or a physical light. That is the form of the soul. What is the soul then? What is the spirit which has a longer life than the physical body and has been there before the body was born and will be there after the body is dead? In what form does it exist? If we all have that soul and that is why we are alive, we should know it. Why should we have to ask somebody else what our soul is like? We should know it. A person who is alive, a person who is conscious should know best what the soul is like. Is it like a candle? Is it like a light? Is it like a sound? What is it like? Well, when we look at our own self and our experience, we find that the living, living consciousness in us consists of our awareness at any time. Whatever we are aware of is ourself. We are aware of our body. We are aware of a world around us. We are aware of our relationships. We are aware of things, trees, plants, windows, rooms, books, all the things that we are aware of. If all the awareness is put together, it would be reasonable to say that is our soul. Fair enough, we don't know any other soul. The only soul we know is that we are aware of things and that awareness, the totality of our awareness is our soul. Therefore, our soul right now consists of our live body, active living body, and all the associations it has with that body. But if the soul has a longer stay than the body, how can we discover that? The only way to discover that is, would this consciousness, this awakeful, this awareness, this wakeful awareness, would this continue if we were totally unaware of these surroundings and the body and the things? That's the starting point. If we became unaware of the body and the things and this world and the relationships, if somehow a mechanics could be found 
to become unaware of all these things and yet we are aware of ourselves, what would the experience, what would be experience of the soul at that time? And that's how the whole question was posed by the mystics. They said, you should be able to experience your consciousness without the forms to which you are tied up now and which makes it appear that that is the soul and that is the life. Now, that's very difficult. How do we become unaware of the body? Well, one of the easiest ways is to die. If you die, you become unaware of the body because body is buried or cremated. You no longer there to have the awareness of the body. But then you don't, you do come to know who you are but it's no good to the others. How can you benefit others? And therefore, a solution was found to this problem that why not find a way of dying in the body while still actually living, dying while living, the old parrot story. Dying while living means that you should have the same experience in the body as if you are dying. That means your consciousness withdraws from the body. So you are no longer conscious. Well, sometimes it happens. In fact, it happens to us every night when we go to sleep. We are not conscious of the body. Every night we die of the body's consciousness. We die and then we wake up and get back into the body again. It happens every night. Every morning we get up and have a fresh experience of the body. What happened during the night? We were dead. So far as the awareness of the body was concerned, we were dead. How can we? But, but what happened? In the dream, when the body was lost to our sensory awareness, what did we do? We created another body. We didn't let go. Consciousness was not dead. We had a dream. In the dream, we had another body. And we ran around with all that body and had all kinds of experiences, nasty, good experiences outside of our control. Like nightmares. We didn't want them. We still had them. And then we got back into this body. We said, wow, that was just a dream. We didn't even pay much attention to the fact that while they, we were unaware of this body, we were having another experience. That you, it is not necessary to be conscious of this body in order to be alive and conscious. Every night we have that experience, we all have that experience. That we are alive and conscious even when we are unaware of this body. We have that experience every day. But there was a little catch in that. When we woke up in the morning, the dream looked unreal. Therefore, we couldn't compare it with this dream, with this, uh, with this waking state. We woke up in the morning, said, thank God it was a dream. That's the end of it. So it wasn't any real experience at all. By dismissing that intermediate experience, we treated that experience as nothing else but an aberration that took place in our consciousness while we were still in the same body. We reconstructed our body to go back into the past right to the time we went to sleep. Do you know we do it every morning? When we wake up in the morning, we don't say, boy, I found my body. We wake up in the morning and say, boy, thank God I was in this body all the time. I never left it. That's why I woke up. I am awake, therefore I never left this body. And the rest was all unreal. It was just a dream. The fact that when we wake up in this body and we can remember that we slept, we can remember we slept in that bed in this body that creates a complete link and this body again becomes the only reality and therefore the form of the soul. And the dream is no longer a form of the soul. If we did not have this kind of continuing memory to link us to the time when we went to sleep, the dream body would become the soul. And we would say, yes, I had a soul and I flew in the soul. If you fly in a, in a dream, you would say, yes, I have a soul, I could fly. The truth is that consciousness per se, independent from this body or dream body, was participating in both experiences equally, with no difference whatsoever. How could you then say that consciousness that was experiencing a dream was in any case inferior, that you have an inferior soul that you use during sleep and you have a superior soul that you use when you are in this body. There is only one consciousness, one soul. It changes its experience. 
and we do it all the time. And people don't like it. They say, no, no, that's sleep. Don't compare any dreaming state with wakeful living state. So the mystics and the yogis, they said, let's solve this problem. Let us try and get a dream in the wakeful state. How about that? What if we could put this body to sleep without sleeping ourselves? Then there would be some, some way of comparing. We dismissed the dream as unreal because it is imaginary and created automatically. How about creating a dream which is not a dream, but an experience in which we remain awake and yet become unconscious of the body? This is where the yogis came up and made a real good suggestion. They said it can be done. You need not go to sleep, because when you go to sleep, the focal point of your consciousness, from what is the focal point of consciousness, I should explain. The focal point of consciousness is the area in the body where you think you are operating from, <clears throat> as consciousness. For example, we are sitting uh, awake now, we want to listen to somebody, we turn our head and we think and we know our throat is below us. Our hands are below us. The whole body is ourself, but the point from where we are giving directions and thinking out and putting questions is somewhere up in the head. So the head becomes the area from which consciousness seems to be operating, which fits in with the, with the material scientist thinking that the brain is really the seat of consciousness. So if brain is the seat of consciousness, is there any particular area within the brain that is closer to this feeling that we are operating from there through meditation? an introspection, one can discover that by closing your eyes, you still feel that you are operating from the head and it's a place just behind the eyes. You can actually feel by closing your eyes that you are still trying to look out into the world, visually at least, from behind the eyes. Now, you can do another experiment and when you are going to sleep at night, before sleeping, when you are awake, you touch your eyes with your hands, your closed eyes. There's no problem. Your hands go straight to your eyes. Then allow yourself to go half asleep, drowsy. And again, touch your eyes. You don't touch your eyes, you touch your nose. You don't touch your nose thinking that you can't touch your eyes. You think these are the eyes. Have you done it? You could try tonight. That when you go to sleep, every night, it's not a rare occurrence, every time you go to sleep, as you go into the sleep state, you are feeling where your eyes are, it self descends. And therefore, what looks like the place behind your eyes itself moves in, in location. And if you are, if you are clever enough to keep, uh, keep your hands ready for touching your eyes and you're just getting a dream state, a dream is coming but you know the body is there, you are in the twilight zone between this physical body and the dream state coming up, say, I want to touch my eyes now when you are seeing the dream, you touch your throat. People have done it. Yogis do it all the time. Who go into a dreamlike state by a controlled means, they know that this so-called feeling that we are behind the eyes looking out, even with eyes closed we know where the eyes are, this feeling itself changes and alters and this focal point of consciousness descends slowly, descends to a drowsiness, takes us towards the nose as we go, when we are dreaming, Completely unaware of this body, we are in the throat center. If we get into deep sleep and, un and forgotten dreams, which we cannot even remember, we go down into the heart center. This feeling that we are there itself descends in this physical body. So we have a movement of the focal point of consciousness taking place. Once we discover that, we can realize why people don't take dreams seriously. Because they are not awake. How, how about keeping this focal point of consciousness at the wakeful state behind the eyes and then getting a dream. Which means, how about keeping this focal point at the eye level and then becoming unaware of the body? Can we do it? Not in the normal course. In the normal course, the moment we start sleeping, it goes down. But what if we don't sleep? But we concentrate on being awake. What if we deliberately want to be awake? What if we want to be awake, more awake than we usually are? What if we want to see what is there when we are awake, what's actually there? And we stay there, not letting ourselves go down. What will happen? 
we'll still become unconscious of the body because we are putting too much concentration here. That's, that's made possible by wonderful feature in the nature of our attention. Our consciousness or awareness flows. We have no consciousness. We have no awareness. What we become aware of is directly proportional to how much attention we give to it. The more attention you give to a thing, the more aware you are of it. So attention and awareness are linked and connected. Awareness is so general. You can be aware of the whole room. Okay. Then you give an attention particularly to the donuts. More and more you think of the donuts, you don't look at the windows. If you eat a donut with all attention, you will not be conscious of the windows behind it. The awareness concentrates itself to the area where you put your attention. This unique feature of human attention makes it possible for us to put our attention behind the eyes where the wakeful state of the focal point of consciousness is and thereby become totally unconscious of everything else including the body. This is called dying while living. This is a true meditational practice that enables us to understand consciousness without having to go to sleep and to go into dream state. If we can have that state of consciousness where we can be aware of ourselves and not aware of this physical body, we not only get to know that we have a form other than this body, we not only know that we can have arms to move and legs to walk with, not of this body. We get to know not only that we have eyes which can see with these eyes closed, we not only get to know that we have ears which can hear without these ears, we get to know we have a memory that goes beyond the memory of this body. This is not something to speculate on. This is something to practice. Whoever has withdrawn attention behind the eyes in the wakeful state to the point of becoming unaware of the body has got back into that form, into that form of consciousness in which you can discover that you were there way earlier than the birth of this body. What else do you want? It's not outside. It's not somebody else's testimony you have to rely upon. You have to rely upon your own memory from the same memory cells in the same area of consciousness from which you are aware of what happened this morning or what happened yesterday to this body. This unique method of using concentration of attention has been used by meditational experts through centuries in every culture in every part of the world. They do it today also. There was one great flaw in this system. A great flaw. And I must draw your attention to it right now. The flaw was that when attention was concentrated, it was always concentrated on something exterior to the self. Something away from the self. People concentrated on a spot, on a face, on an idea, on a thought on something other than themselves, with the result that the whole energy was devoted to discovering more and more of the thing on which the concentration took place instead of discovering the self. Therefore, they never got the knowledge of the self at all. They got a lot of knowledge of what they were concentrating on. If they were concentrating on an idea, they got a lot of idea, knowledge about that idea. If they were concentrating on a thing, you could see a red spot on the wall and concentrate on it. After a time, that red spot starts spinning. After a while, you see everything red. After that, you get right into it. After that, you can see every molecule. You can see the whole spectrum. You can see everything about red, everything about color, everything about light, everything about the past, present, and future of the spot. But you know nothing about yourself. You know nothing about the nature of consciousness that is able to pick up all this from a red spot. That was a big flaw. All these exercises in concentrating attention were flawed because the direction of attention continued to be the same as we had practiced from birth onwards. That was from within outward. This attention, human attention, human consciousness has been flowing from inside the head outside. We open our eyes and look out and there goes the attention. We want to see what is there. We want to hear what is outside. We want to think of what happened there. Our memories are linked with outside experiences. 
and all the concentration of attention went to picking up those experiences which were outside of the self. Therefore, there was no real knowledge of the self coming up. There were great experiences, experiences of great trance, great tranquility, great depth of awareness, unusual worlds, almost like taking mushrooms and all LSDs and things like that. People without taking anything were able to get those experiences, which in the 60s I used to call turning on, turning on without drugs. This is very possible, very easy to turn on without drugs just by concentrating very deliberately and on any particular thing. You could turn on, but there was no self-realization involved at all. There was no growth in the knowledge of the self. What was required was a reversal of the direction of flow of attention. If the attention was flowing out, to reverse it, instead of going out, it should come back. All the attention that is now scattered, and we sit in meditation and close our eyes, and all the thoughts come from there and there to bring them back to the point behind the eyes, so that we discover where it is going out from, not discover what we are attending to earlier. This withdrawal of attention was totally opposite to the concentration of attention outside. And this flaw could not be caught by anybody, except by those mystic adepts, except by those practitioners who, guided by their expert masters, had practiced the withdrawal of attention. I am not aware of anybody in this world being able to withdraw attention without the help of an adept who himself has withdrawn attention, because we are used to putting attention on something else other than the self. We have no notion of the self. The self is the whole conglomeration of experience. It's not a single point. Therefore, we don't know where to sit on that point. The mystic adept can locate a point for us, help us to show the error we make by concentrating somewhere other than our own self. Stage by stage, bring us back to reversal of the flow of attention and concentration of attention and bring it to the self. When this reversal takes place and that flaw is taken care of, then we truly experience the self without the awareness of this body and we become aware of another body. We call it a body because it looks like a body. We call it a body because it behaves like this body. We call it a body because it can see, it can hear, touch, taste and smell. It can move. Why shouldn't we call it a body? But it is not a body because it has no weight. We don't go to any neutrous, neutrous limbs or whatever. What does it call those centers? We don't go to any place for weight loss. There is no weight in that body. We all have it. You just withdraw attention from this body and you discover you have a regular body, regular in the sense it has all the sense perceptions. It has all the mechanism. It doesn't have the molecules and atoms of a physical body, but it has all the awareness of a body. You are aware of hands and feet. You are aware of a head. You are aware of eyes. You are aware of moving. In terms of awareness, it is somewhat similar to the dream body. It is somewhat similar to the body we use in a dream to run around, which also has no weight, no problem. It can even fly, jump, doesn't get hurt. Yet, it is different from the dream body now because we are experiencing it without going to sleep. We are experiencing while we are still awake. And that gives us conviction that this is not fantasy because we didn't go to sleep. This practice of withdrawal of attention and going back to our own inner self, our real self, which has all the capabilities of having sense perception, not losing any sense perception, in fact, enhancing sense perception, gives us conviction directly by our own experience of what our true reality is and where we stand. When I said that it enhances perception, I should explain it. When we look through these eyes, physical eyes, we always assume we are seeing because we have these eyes. And if we close these eyes, we don't see. We open these eyes, we see. Therefore, all the power of seeing, we attribute to these eyes. 
We don't realize if we are unconscious and we have our eyes open, we don't see. There must be some link between consciousness and seeing. But we are constantly giving credit to these physical eyes for seeing. If we are even half asleep, the eyes are open, we don't see. Surely our level of consciousness determines whether we see or not, and not these eyes. And if these eyes were alone responsible for seeing, we could not see in imagination at all, nor could we see in a dream. Which are those eyes that see in a dream and see visually? Which are those eyes that see in imagination? Right now you can imagine something, it comes before you. These are not the eyes that are seeing that. Which eye is seeing that? We are confusing the power to have the sight to see with these eyes. The truth is that we are so accustomed to identifying our consciousness with this body that we have deliberately chosen to limit the power of seeing to what we can see with these eyes. And therefore, these eyes are being given undue credit for the power to see. And therefore, whatever these eyes can see, we think is only what can be seen. And therefore, we can see much less than we actually can with our real conscious body. We have limited ourselves. So once we release ourselves from this limitation and we start seeing without having to open these eyes, we discover that we were always seeing with those eyes, never with these. That these eyes were used as apertures to see with those eyes, which were the eyes of the sensory perception of consciousness. And these eyes restricted how much we could see and not that they enhanced what we could see. And without these eyes, without the consciousness of the body, we can see more than we can see with these eyes. This is not a, this is not a hypothesis. I'm not suggesting a philosophy it's possible or not. This is something that anybody can practice and see. Anybody who practices withdrawal of attention gets this experience. I have not met anybody in the whole universe who can say, I practice and I didn't see. Once you are conscious and awake and unaware of the body, you see better than you see now. People who even accidentally get into that, they wonder why, how they can see without glasses. People are used to using very high-powered glasses. Did you know that people even give up their glasses in dreams? Do you know people have a dream, they are using very thick glasses, they can't see without them. In the dream, they take off the glasses, they can still see. What happens to their vision? Who, who repairs their vision? And do you know that when you are in meditation and you have drawn your attention to your own self, the same conscious self, and this body and the, and the deformity of this lens and the deformity of this iris and the vitreous and aqueous humor in the eye is not bothering you, you see better. You don't need any glasses. I don't see people wearing glasses in the astral world. <laughs> they don't need them. So it's not only a question of there being no weight and there being no other problem, there are no other health problems either. There's no problem of aging either. You can adopt your age and stay at that age as long as you like. It's a different kind of experience and yet it is not somebody else's experience we are reading about. It is our experience. It's our experience untied to an identification with this body as the self. When we say the conscious self is this body, we tie ourselves to all the problems of this body as, as if they are our problems, without realizing they are the problems of a physical form, they are problems of a physical manifestation of that consciousness. It's a great experience to be able to see that we have more than this body, that the sensory perceptions of this body are coming from the existence of the sensory perceptions of what looks like another ethereal, fine, very fine, weightless body. The truth is, we shouldn't call that body. The so-called sensory or astral body is nothing more than the sense perceptions themselves. Now, this is something I have, I have difficulty in communicating to people because it's very easy for us based upon material sciences that we have been exposed to all the time, everything must be visual and, and should be material. It's very easy to say, there's this physical body, there's an astral body, causal body, all the bodies we can see clearly, visualize. But they don't exist like that. If you want to know the truth, the, the senses themselves are the astral body. What we call sense perceptions, they are, they are capable of existing without need of any physical system. And when they exist as one unit with one soul, 
with one life force, with one memory, with one link, with one mind, we call that the astral body. But the functions of the astral body is no more than the sensory perceptions which we are experiencing even in this body. And what happens next? Well, the system that the mystic adepts have taught us still holds good. If you feel you have a body which is of senses and is light and can fly and can do other things, withdraw your attention to the center of consciousness of that body. You withdraw your attention in the same way, precisely the same method. Get back more and more to your own self. Whatever looks like the self, whatever feels like the self, whatever you are conscious of is your own self. Don't stay with perceptions. Don't stay with senses. Withdraw yourself to where those senses are leading you. Get back to your own self and not into the senses. What happens when you do that? As you withdraw, you become unaware of the senses. It is precisely a copy at a higher level of what has happened when we become unaware of the physical body in meditation. In meditation, we become unaware of the senses and yet, because we are awake, we are awake even at the heightened state, we become conscious of ourself in a different form. Well, then we have another body. Let me say we have another body. We call it the causal body. Why do we call it causal body? Because it causes all other experiences to happen. Every experience that we have ever had, including all the law of karma operating, is taking place and the cause of all this experience to the human consciousness in the astral and physical bodies is arising from our nature of the causal self, of the causal body. The causal body, well, we call it body because all the thoughts we have ever had are emanating from that body. All the thoughts are surrounding us. The whole thinking process, past, present and future, all the thoughts that came first, the thoughts that are coming now and will come are right around us. In fact, those thoughts are our body. In fact, the mind is the body, what we call causal body. There is no body as such. But for the sake of starting for novice, we say, oh, there is another body called... It's inside this body and it's a, a oblong type, you know. Rosicrucians came up with great descriptions and drew photographs and diagrams of how these bodies can be seen. But the truth is the causal body appears to have a form to our own self. It doesn't have a physical form at all. It doesn't have a form that can be perceived by senses at all. Yet it is a form that can be experienced as a concept. Now, I have been against concepts most of the time that we are all caught up in concepts. For once, I want to praise a concept that the concepts are being generated and we are a concept at that stage and all concepts are fitting into what is our form. If you can understand how concepts are made, you will know the stuff of the causal body. If you know whatever makes a concept, you can see a concept. You don't have to reason out a concept. The concept, once it has become part of your thinking, is there. You have, you, you have concept of everything in this world. You have concept of what is love. The moment you say love, the whole concept of love comes up. You don't have to spell it out every time. You have a concept of your body. It comes up immediately. You can visualize it in a second. You have a concept of hatred, concept of envy, anger, concept of non-material things concept of non-sensory things. You have a concept of God. You have a concept of happiness. Say happiness, you know at once what, are, what we are talking about. It's only a concept. If you put all these concepts together, that's your causal body. The causal body is your whole mind put together with consciousness. And yet there are no senses involved and there is no physical system involved. And yet it is the same self. It's the same self that today says, who am I? Where am I? The same self is discovering its own causal nature and causal self. That's the, you can call it causal body for sake, of, for sake of being consistent with physical systems. Otherwise, the causal body is no different from what we call the mind. And the mind is no different from consciousness operating with space, time and causation. Putting everything in a causal sequence. 
Whatever puts things into a causal sequence, whatever puts our experience into a causal sequence is our causal body, is our mind. Mind is not a thing. Mind is also not a candle or something that we are carrying inside. Mind is this ability to create time space continuum, to create these frameworks and put experience into it. And the same mind is used when we go into an astral form or sensory form, the same mind is used when we go into the physical form, the same mind holds the memory. Memory is not held on the body, nor on the brain. The brain reflects the memory held by the mind. The mind holds all memory. The mind holds all memory and because memory by the call creates this world, the mind is the creator of all this world. The mind creates all our experiences by holding memory upon itself. The mind is not a thing. The mind is a function. The mind is a function which operating in conjunction with consciousness can create a past, present and future and therefore memories of anything that is possible. The mind can imagine out anything possible, whatever can be possible becomes possible in the sensory and the physical worlds. That is how it is the creator of everything. All things that we see in these three worlds, the causal, the astral and the physical are a creation of the mind. And that includes all the law of karma, all reincarnation, all different past lives and future lives, all memories, all notions of, an, of a God who once created this world, all notions of the world coming to an end, all this knowledge which is confined to time, space and causation is created by that mind. It doesn't exist if the mind doesn't exist. And yet the mind creating all this is alive because it is conscious and consciousness has been pumped into it because of us, the self. This is the most difficult part in the spiritual progress, to see that the mind and consciousness are not the same. This is the most difficult part. We have identified ourselves with this body only for a short while, from birth. Before we were born, we had no notion this is our body. It's just few years. 50, 60, 100 years, 10 years, 20 years makes no difference. It's so short. In the time span of the mind of millions of years, this is too short a period to get so, so much identified with it that we cannot pull out. It's easy to pull out our consciousness from this body because the association with this body, the identification with this body is recent. It is relatively difficult to pull out of the sensory systems, but one can still do it without too much difficulty. The most difficult thing is to even know, even to speculate, even to conceive that the consciousness is not the mind. That mind is being used like the other bodies and consciousness can exist per se without mind. The most difficult thing and very few people in recorded history have ever attained that state when they could separate the consciousness of the self from the mind that they were carrying. Therefore, if you look at the schools of yoga, even in the Orient, even in East, even in India, you will find they all stopped at the universal mind as being the end of all things, that all creation took place from there. Their notion of creation is that which occurs in time and space. And therefore, since they discovered that the mind creates everything, the universal mind, the single mind created all these things in time and space, therefore that was their God and that was their end creator. They could not go beyond that. Rarely, very rarely, some mystic adept, adept hiding somewhere and coming out not for teaching the glory of a universal mind, but coming out for a specific task of picking out marked souls, not minds, marked souls would appear once in a while and that great master who would appear like this would come up and teach us. You are not the body, you are not the senses, you are not even the mind, you are the soul. And the soul is not the same as the mind. It's a rare teacher who says this. It's not commonplace. Everybody doesn't say this. When I first came to this country in 60s to study near, nearby here, they would talk to me with complete interchange of these terms. Well, this consciousness or mind, soul, whatever you like to call it, as if it made no difference. 
this consciousness or mind or soul, whatever you like to call it. They didn't want to go into the distinction. But the distinction was so sharp. The distinction was so radical. I could not help telling them, don't you see the difference? That the mind cannot operate in vacuum? Don't you see that the mind has no possibility of functioning without time? Don't you see that thought cannot exist if there is no time? That there is no thought that has ever come to anybody without time? And yet there is intuition coming to you in human form without time. How can you ascribe an intuition which is not a thought coming to you suddenly as a revelation, a sudden discovery, sudden knowledge without thought, without time? And you still don't see that the mind requires time for every action? Who is getting that intuition? Who is getting the sudden feeling, timeless feeling of love at once for somebody without thought? Is it the mind? The mind needs time. And it came to occur that people began to say, Oh, now we understand. You come from India. You come from the, you are using the word soul. We don't call it soul. We call it right side of the mind. I said, mind doesn't have right and left side, even brain. Oh, right brain is the same. But what you are talking, intuition comes from the right brain and this thinking comes from left brain and this is that lobe and they brought me down to, to seeing with probes what, what little molecules in the flesh was holding these great secrets. Obviously they had done no meditation. It is clear to me that if a person wants to discover the nature of intuition by looking at the lobes of the brain, he has done no meditation and has not had access to the self. I said so. I said, go ahead, go within that brain. Go and explore the brain. There was a great guy, what is his name, Werner Erhard, who started the Erhard uh, seminar training program, the EST programs. And in the EST programs, which I attended twice, when he brought it to India, I attended that program and he would say, well, with attention, you can go into a piece of fruit. He gave us an orange and said, now go inside the peel and see the juice inside. And we, by our imagination, went all over. I said, boy, that's a great experience. I've never seen an orange so well as I did during the EST program. Nor did I know a nut and other things too. I mean, strange things he taught us how to go into and see. And I said, boy, here is a fellow coming from United States of America. He knows the art of going deep through concentration, through consciousness. He can go deep into these material things. Why doesn't he go into his own brain? He wants the brain to be seen by somebody else by probing it from outside. Why doesn't he probe it from inside? Why doesn't he go inside his own brain in the head, right in the middle, just above the medulla oblongata? Let him stand in the middle, above the spine, and see what is happening there. Why doesn't he use his inner probes? Well, if he did that, he would be a meditator. He wouldn't argue with me. A person who does that, who goes inside the brain by the same method, discovers the truth. The truth lies inside. They don't do it. They don't want to do meditation and go with it. They want to talk of a scientific probes, electronic probes looking at somebody else's brain. Not their own brain. They don't want to see what the self is. They want to see what other cells are. How can they find the other cells? They, are, they, are, they can only see the body. They cannot see the mind. So when you come to this stage and perfect living masters, we call them PLMs, perfect living masters. I mean, they are not called PLMs in India. The system of abbreviations I learned here, that everything should be abbreviated, GM, PLM, you know. <laughs> these, these perfect living masters, we call them perfect because they have transcended the imperfection of time created by mind. That's the real reason. Perfect living masters are those who have attained that perfect knowledge of permanence. Even the mind has a history and you can find out that although this body lives only 100 years or so and the astral body lives a 1000 or 10,000 years or so, the mind lives millions of years. But it also has a life. It has a birth, a life in which it takes several forms, retaining the same memory for millions of years, the same being, the same person, the same reincarnation, the same karma. And then ultimately when the mind dies, the whole setup is cancelled and finished and you start all over again. That mind has a life. But the soul, the consciousness, which constitutes the self and makes the mind alive, does not have any life. It is permanent. It is really immortal. 
So the immortal soul, which is consciousness per se, not needing time and space, not needing a mind, not needing senses, not needing this body, that soul, that consciousness, transcends all mental activity. Therefore, it is above thoughts, it is above concepts, it is above all this mental state which has created this universe. It is above karma, it is above reincarnation, it is above any known nature of time. All these are illusions created by the mind. The moment the mind steps in, it creates illusions that there is a real life going on, it's gone on for millions of years, there are past lives and there are future lives, we are bound by karma, we are suffering because of that. We keep on suffering for millions of years because we don't get out of this. If we, if we can follow, first of all if we can find, and then we can follow a perfect living master. A perfect living master who has perfectly found the way to transcend this boundary of the mind. If we can follow, we can transcend this into reality of our own self and discover that consciousness per se is the spirit. That consciousness does not need the aids of these bodies in order to exist, that exists anyway. Not only that, that consciousness is more conscious. Now I have to say, it's more conscious, more aware without any bodies than it is with the bodies. The consciousness knows the nature of a concept and logic more without the mind than with the mind. The mind limits the power of the consciousness to know the nature of a concept. Just like the sensory perceptions limit the power of the mind to conceive beyond senses. Just like this physical body limits the power of the senses to go beyond what can be seen through the sense organs of this body.